I first encountered Fassbinder's films um, in the early 80s when I was in college. Um, and by this point, particularly in sort of in academic circles and, and sort of film cineast circles, the films had sort of reached a critical mass and entered the American consciousness. And the program I was in at Brown uh, was then called the Semiotics Program. It was not a full-fledged department, but it was within the English program. It's very influenced by a lot of the new theory, film theory, uh, feminist film criticism that was coming out of Europe. Um, <clears throat> and so along with that emphasis on sort of traditions of women's films in Hollywood, there was obviously this excitement around the work of Fassbinder and the direct link to the melodramas of Douglas Sirk from the 50s, which had been the subject of a lot of writing by people like Laura Mulvey and Marianne Doan. Now, Fassbinder had started making films, I think, in 1969, coming out of uh, sort of radical um, theater experiments in the late 60s in Germany. The really interesting thing to, to keep in mind is that Fassbinder was making films at the, you know, the sort of political peak of counterculture. So his peer group and the people that he was surrounded by were in France, Godard, and, and people working in a very directly political kind of cinema who was inspiring everyone. And then in Germany, what was going to become the new Ger German cinema would be, uh, you know, characterized by people like Straub Houlet, Alexander Klug, uh, Werner Schroeder, um, people who were uh, basically trying to take a lot of the political sent sentiments and questioning going on and apply them directly to narrative. What went along with that was a rejection of classic Hollywood narrative and its more emotional driven, um, ultimately, you know, manipulative and corrupt uh, forms. So, and Fassbinder's first 10 whatever films in his career reflected this more personal um, questioning about how narrative can be used politically. Uh, they're cooler films, they're more, um, they have a sort of deadpan critique of uh, German society at that time. Then all, all of a sudden, Reiner Werner Fassbinder goes to see some Cirque films in 1971. He, I think someone who, like Fassbinder, who was so rigorously critical of dominant culture and generated the kind of aura of extreme pessimism about the possibilities for human happiness and freedom was completely taken off guard by the direct tenderness as he described it in these Cirque films. A lot of people would look at these Cirque films and that would be the very last thing that they would see. Tenderness, human fragility. Um, but what Cirque did for Fassbinder, I think, was show that you could be extremely simple and very direct with your narrative language in a movie. And, but show people suffering, show people who you identify with, not due to their sort of free agency as people who are going to find you, you know, infinite uh, new territories or terrains, but actually people who you identify with because of their captivity in rigid societies that we all share. So that opened up a whole new idea to him. I think he also really liked, in a way, being adversarial even to his Marxist contemporaries and beginning to challenge this whole, this whole contempt, this easy contempt for Hollywood and its, and its forms. Um, but what it, in a deeper level, I think what it really started to do was clarify Fassbinder's project. And there's a beautiful quote that, I, that I've taken very much to heart in my own work, um, because it so goes against, I think, a very basic liberal tradition in narrative, which is that you can tell stories about how you feel, you can put your messages into movies, you can, uh, and whether you, that's happening at a Hollywood level, or it's happening by Godard, who's basically, whose political discourse is all over the body and form of his work, um, Fassbinder began to identify a problem with this. And he writes in, I think this is 75, people often criticize my films for being pessimistic. Uh, there are certainly plenty of reasons for being pessimistic, but I don't see my films that way. They are founded in the belief that revolution doesn't belong on the cinema screen, but outside in the world. Never mind if a film ends pessimistically, if it exposes certain mechanisms clearly enough to show people how exactly they work then the ultimate effect is not pessimistic. My goal is to reveal such mechanisms in a way 
that makes people realize the necessity of changing their own reality. So he felt that films that tried to do it for you deprived you of, you know, were ultimately apolitical. So having encountered Cirque and Fassbender when I did in the early 80s, uh, these are films and filmmakers that stayed in my mind and in my work. Uh, from that point on, I started to make films of my own, well, in high school, but continued with a more serious effort through college and after college, and made my first feature film, Poison, in 1991. Um, and really, I, I have to say, I, I applied aspects of Cirque and Fassbinder, I think, to all of my films that, that came out in the 90s. And finally, uh, when the decade ended, I, I felt that it was time to really get into this specific influence more directly. So I went back to All That Heaven Allows, Cirque's beautiful 1956 film starring Jane Wyman and Rock Hudson. And it's the same film that, for most practical purposes, uh, Fassbinder was looking at as well when he made Ali Fereed's The Soul. The whole title, All That Heaven Allows, to begin with, sort of implies, um, on the one hand, it can be interpreted as it was by the Universal Studio heads. It's this incredibly, um, you know, um, positive, inviting, plentiful kind of, you know, message of, of heaven including, but actually um, Cirque meant it a completely opposite way. He said heaven, I always thought heaven was stingy. So it's about who is forbidden in heaven as much as it is who's allowed. But there, there's obviously some very basic similarities between the two films in terms of their um, setting, the uh, idea of an inappropriate match of an older woman and a younger man, which Fassbinder takes several steps further with a racial um, conflict and a much more extreme age difference. But what's interesting are also, I think, maybe the differences between the two, um, in that you learn right away in, in Ali Fereed's The Soul that the Emmy character um, and Brigitte Mira's beautiful, um, solid performance of her is this incredibly good person, this, this sort of innately um, unarrogant, um, uh, accepting personality. But and as Jane Wyman is in, in All That Heaven Allows and as Julianne Moore is in, in my film Far From Heaven, but Emmy somehow, I don't know, she has a more steadfast um, connection to her beliefs that is not at all uh, demonstrative, that's extremely just innate in her character, in her person. And so she sticks to her values very, very um, consistently throughout the story. Uh, in ways you don't you don't see the Jane Wyman character capable of doing. In many ways, the Rock Hudson character in All That Heaven Allows, who's sort of standing in for this, you know, innate moralism, um, is closer, I think, to the character uh, of Emmy in in um, in Ali. And conversely, um, it's Ali <clears throat> who is more corruptible and is more ambivalent as he does get accepted into this society ultimately on, under certain terms and and then rejects it and you see him going and sort of transgressing against uh, his wife um, and having sex with the bar owner. In many ways it's closer to the ambivalence and the susceptibility that Jane Wyman feels in All That Heaven Allows when the society kind of keeps pulling her back and forth between her desire and her sort of social station. Uh, definitely one of the things that Cirque ignited for Fassbinder, and it goes along with the tradition of the melodrama to a large degree, which are often films set in domestic settings, is uh, films about women and focusing on female characters. Uh, Hannah Shagula was already figuring in the early films of Fassbinder, um, but it wouldn't be till later that she really became singled out, almost has his leading female star, and in films that became increasingly about central female characters, whether or not they fell into this sort of domestic melodrama um, definition. But uh, when he first saw the Cirque films, he was struck by um, a whole different way in which women were pictured in these films. Um, and without eschewing the conventions of, of uh, narrative filmmaking from that particular time, um, he saw a different kind of treatment of women, and he describes uh, uh, this when he writes about the Douglas Sirk films. In Douglas Sirk movies, the women think. I haven't noticed that with any other director, with any. Usually women just react, do the things women do, and here they actually think. 
that's something you've got to see. That gives you hope. So again, there was something innately tender, hopeful, positive, things you don't associate with Reiner Werner Fassbinder in general, in what he saw in Cirque and his ability to sort of give a loving care to the central female characters in these films. And, um, and how much the more passive role of a female in a, in a social setting can describe about the limits and the desires of people struggling within societies. Uh, women became sort of regular centerpieces of Fassbinder's films. And some of the amazing women that you see in performances from Bricky Demira to Margaret Karstensen to Hanna Shigula <coughs> to Ava Matas um, throughout the career um, is something that I guess we can certainly thank Cirque for. I think the amazing thing about this film of Fassbinder's is that the entire movie is constructed both uh, formally and in its content around looking, around one character looking at another character, around characters being looked at, around looks of desire and looks of that define the most rigid social stations of insider-outsider. And, and so, and it, what, the amazing thing that this does in the movie is that it freezes both parties. The looker and the looky are frozen in the look. And it sets them in these very rigid positions <clears throat> that he uses both dramatically and aesthetically, but it relates, you know, um, implicitly to the themes of the film. Uh, where these people are made to feel um, like pariahs for their love for each other. Um, but then Fassbinder takes that further which in a beautiful way, where ultimately you learn that um, society also needs to continually overcome um, or keep recycling the outsiders. And, and so this act of incorporation and appropriation is always at work as well. Yes, we One of the first yeah. times we see Emmy at her workplace, sitting on the stairs for lunch with her coworkers, they know that she's been seeing this Moroccan man and this outsider, this foreigner. And um, they walk, move away from her and leave her sitting on the stairs, and she's framed in the shot between the, the banisters of the stairways and also between the doorway, looking into the stairwell. And she's alone, and, and the, the coworkers are all whispering to each other on the side. And it's only later in the film when the whole cycle has changed and everyone's own sort of immediate selfish needs allow Emmy to be re-included in the social fabric. There's a new woman who's replaced a coworker who was caught stealing this Eastern European girl, and she's sitting on the stairs in exactly the same place as Emmy, and Emmy's now been brought into the corner to be privy to this private discussion. And you see that the society is basically based on exclusion of some kind. You know, it's almost the precondition for anybody being let in, is somebody being kept out. The tension between um, our distance as viewers from the film, the way in which he is constantly framing these characters through doorways in these very static, stiff shots, and in many ways the blocking of the actors um, is, is conceived accordingly. There's a kind of rigidity of their movements. And, um, uh, and the scene where um, Ali is finally accepted by Emmy's friends is played out in this beautifully sustained long shot of the entire living room where um, Emmy finally says, oh, you know, come up and feel his muscles. And all the ladies kind of run up in the same held shot and start feeling Ali's muscles. And we're kept at a distance from him. And in a way, it makes me wonder about this whole idea of identification that's supposed to be a, where distance and alienation is supposed to be the, you know, the biggest barrier to identification with a character. In this case, the distance that we feel physically from Ali almost deepens our identification with him because of the distance that he's feeling in this new alienated acceptance. You know, he's accepted as the exotic other now, and they can finally feel his muscles and derive some secondary thrill out of that. But what must that be like for him? And the distance that Fassbinder insists on, um, I think, deepens the identification and deepens the connection to that character.
another beautiful scene in which this whole uh, tension between um, the fragility of these pe people's lives and the rigidity and, and stiffness of the visual treatment is the beautiful open air restaurant scene in Ali Fury's Soul, which I think is maybe the most beautiful scene in the film and one of the most beautiful in Fassbender. Um, and it's a scene I've, I've even quoted in, in some of my films. I, I blatantly rip it off in my film Poison. That scene is described beautifully by Christian Broad Thompson in his book on Fassbinder. Uh, the deliberate stiffness of the arrangement constitutes an effective contrast to Emmy's tears so that Fassbinder summarizes in a single brilliant moment what he has always been striving for, emotional density and intellectual clarity, identification and distance, sympathy and observation. And what's so cool about that, and I think it's so true, and it's something I, I was definitely striving for in Far From Heaven, is that there are ways in which non-traditional identification, movies that you're more aware of the social framework, or as aware of the social framework as the, the poor people struggling within it, it's more, I guess, a, a process of recognition than identification, is that I think the emotional connection can be deeper and more profound than when it's geared solely through the single point of view and eyes of one protagonist, which you can't really say about any of these films that we're talking about. This, this whole regime of looks is something that it's pushed to a, stylize, a stylization in the treatment of the filmmaking where groups of characters literally freeze in tableaus and absolutely don't move. And it puts the sort of tenderness and the fragility of this romance in extreme relief against that tension. It's true in the opening scene of Ali that immediately sets up this system of looks from the very first shot. And al although this, this whole idea of a chorus of society freezing into stares um, and what that does to the subjects of movies who are made to feel instantly as outsiders or th threats to, this, to the status quo, um, you'll see this in some of my films coming quite directly from Fassbinder's influence. In Far From Heaven, it really becomes a thematic um, element in the story uh, it's at the art gallery scene where Julianne Moore is surprised to find her very um, charming and intelligent gardener, um, the black man uh, played by Dennis Haysbert with his daughter and he's the only black person in this room of white society ladies and their husbands. Um, they connect and start to talk about the art and, uh, and yeah the film is sort of framed by these, these tableau shots of people frozen in stairs, um, and it's the scene from which she derives the whole idea of being the only one uh, in a room that she begins, that she identifies as something that he experiences, and then later he kind of brings that experience full circle when he takes her to the black bar in which she's the only one in the room. Many of Fassbender's films after um, his encountering of Douglas Sirk um, were films about women characters. But they were also films about every possible minority, um, people of color, gay people, um, anarchists uh, in the third generation. And what's so brilliant about that, and what definitely has inspired me too as a gay filmmaker, uh, is that, is that um, no one is left off the hook. Uh, all of the subjects of Fassbinder films are as much the victims and perpetrators of the power dynamic that, that is his real critique in these films. In Fox and His Friends, uh, the character that he himself plays, the sort of hapless um, um, you know, guy at a carnival who gets sucked into this very wealthy, elitist, gay um, society, is completely exploited by these very fashionable gay men in the film. And uh, so again, the, the critique is across the board, and I think he's very interested in the ways in which victims, in fact, participate in the power dynamics that um, are ultimately the, the product of societies. Um, so it's a, it's a very different kind of approach, and, and it inspired, to a large degree, the fact that the way Dennis Quaid's character in Far From Heaven is not played for liberationist uh, motivation. He is uh, suffering terribly, and we understand that, but we also see the way in which he lashes out at Julianne Moore and ultimately occupies the double standard, whereas a man and as someone who could hide in pursuing his desires and his needs as a gay person, 
uh, gets much further along in that search than his wife, who has to ultimately be straddled with the responsibility of maintaining the household and keeping it all going at, at any cost. Something that Fassbinder took very much to heart from Cirque, um, who articulates it very clearly, is that the characters have to be in the dark, basically. It's part of this whole idea of not giving the answer in your movie. Uh, characters can never be in possession of the message of the film that they're in and be the articulators of that message. At that point, you've failed. You've, you've, you've um, foreclosed any possibility for an audience member to do something active in response to this experience of watching a movie. I think that's all that this is about is, is instigating activity on the, in the minds and in the emotions of the viewer. It's not emotional until we fill it in with our experiences, our lives, our interpretations of what's happening on screen. And when it's all done for you, there's nothing for us to do. And we're passive, like the subjects of those looks in Ali Furitz's Soul. Cirque describes it in those interviews from 71 as saying, your characters have to remain innocent of what the picture is after. They should never step forward. People shouldn't be what in German is called eindeutig, with only one meaning. All the contradictions of a character have to be there. That's why um, Fassbinder can so beautifully get away with the fact that Emmy sees no problem in loving a much younger African man. Still talks about Hitler, you know, and talks about the days when we were all part of the party and takes him to the Hitler restaurant as, as, on their wedding day, you know. Uh, these contradictions show us that she is not, even though she has these very innate good and moral instincts, that she's also a completely a subject and a construct of her society. And those contradictions are things that we can learn from and that we can see around. Um, it's sort of, and it is, it's very much what Fassbinder himself says when he talks about Cirque. They keep kind of patting each other on the back. Uh, Cirque has said that you can't make films about something. You can only make films with something with people, with light, with flowers, with mirrors, with blood, with all these crazy things that make it worthwhile. And Cirque has made the most tender ones I know, films by a man who loves human beings and doesn't despise them as we do. <laughs>